the real test for these large language models is, here's a small paragraph. Can you construct the thought formally behind this? Because there's understanding that's specific to language. And there's understanding the bigger understanding. So can you uh, just back up a minute and define yeah. a little bit but what you mean by the, in the difference between symbolic and sub-symbolic AI and how that plays out in the prevailing approach towards AI? Right. Uh, in the dominant paradigm now, which still is, but we're trying to uh, turn the house down, some of us, is uh, the neural network paradigm, which is essentially uh a completely extensional as opposed to intentional i we can get to that later but essentially it has no symbols like remember we talked about uh, in traditional symbolic systems you will have a an attribute for let's say car uh, when we model cars in a car insurance system or or a car dealership or or a manufacturing setting a car has attributes like the color this the the year of make the the model the number of uh, what do you call them when you say v6 versus v8 or whatever uh, the horsepower it has attributes in symbolic systems, we actually have symbols like color, and it has a symbol, red. Uh, number of uh, the horsepower, 365 symbols, right? Now, then symbols can be strings, numbers, booleans, whatever. None of that exists in a neural network. In a neural network, all we have are weights that represent statistical correlations. There are no symbols at all. Like there are, everything is, uh, we have, that's why we call them sub-symbolic. A symbol is distributed. So the color of a car is distributed across 200 or 500 neurons and sub-symbols, micro-features. So instead of features, we speak of micro-features. It's a distributed representation completely. Right, so in all these connections and all these weights, not nowhere in the neural network I can go and point at the color of the car. The color of the car is a combination of so many neurons activated because they have 0 0.75, 0 0.86 weight, and so on. And all of that semantic, not semantic, all of that subspace represents the color of the car and also some other things. That's how things are entangled. And that's why these models are unexplainable. You can't explain your reasoning because the logic is completely distributed and completely micro feature to the quantum level. Like they're all real numbers. There are no symbols at all. Uh, Roughly, that's symbolic, sub-symbolic. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a there's an advantage to that model in pattern recognition applications because naturally, when I see a, a cat, right, an image of a cat, I don't see actual micro uh, actual features like what are the attributes in the image, like uh, the the direction of the whiskers. I mean it. In those applications, it makes sense to take a blob of pixels, blob of signals, right? And holistically, in a gestalt way, we say all of that thing somehow looks like a cat. Don't tell me to structure the attributes. Like, I can't give you actual attributes. Like, what, what are the attributes? The, the, the uh, proximity of the whisker to the eye like that's not an like you know what I mean uh, I'm trying mm -hmm. to get the so in those applications these models which are a holistic like this blob of thing looks like a cat don't ask me why I don't have real features right I mean I have a statistical 
sort of correlation between things and they all point to something we call a cat. That's it, right? And so this is a powerful thing, but in pattern recognition only. Because, and actually the whole rise of deep learning and machine learning came out of successfully beating everybody by a huge percentage in the ImageNet competition. And it succeeded in other pattern recognition application like speech synthesis, because it's also about pattern recognition. First, I go like, if we have such an awesome technology, there's a there's a paradox here. Just a couple of years ago, and this is actually a fact. I was in the Sil I was in Silicon Valley. People were saying, uh, people were afraid of another AI winter because all the chatbot stuff was failing, like all the startups were, were collapsing one after the other because we trivialize what it takes to engage in a conversation with these smart uh, conversational AI assistants, right? And they were failing really one after the other. Autonomous driving was failing like crazy and to the point where we admitted all we have is advanced cruise control. So just a couple of years ago, really, literally, uh, we were afraid of another AI winter because that's what an AI winter, uh, that's what triggers an AI winter. High expectations, big claims, and we don't deliver and we waste a lot of money. That's what happened. And all of a sudden we're talking about an AI that's going to take uh, over humanity. Like something doesn't add up, you know what I mean? Like how, how could we be on the verge of an AI winter? Everything is failing. And all of a sudden in two years, we created a super intelligent AI. Something doesn't add up. Some people are not telling the truth. And then I go through what I think has happened in AI. We have massive computational power these days where we have clusters of powerful GPUs. And we have lots of data and we have the machinery to process this massive data. So we're doing computational statistics, really, analytics. Uh, and we did the same with language, thus large language models. but. That's it, but we don't have anything called human level understanding or reasoning. And so we definitely don't have to fear a super intelligent AI. I did that just for fun. So I told everybody, don't worry. And then I go through the history of large language models. Briefly, that we for three decades, we worked with top down approaches, relying on um, Chomsky and generative linguistics or cognitive linguistics by lack of Pinker. All former logical semantics, people like Richard Montague, Jerry Fodor, etc. And I say that top down, it's not surprising that it didn't work because we don't have anything to go by when it comes to language and thoughts and how we externalize thoughts and language. So obviously top down approaches were doomed to fail because we were creating our own theories. And unless by accident we figured out how it works in the mind, it's not going to work because we don't know. And that's and no surprise that these large language models of today at least got much farther than anything else because at least they uh, they followed the right strategy, which is a bottom up reverse engineering strategy. And I then I talk about what these guys have achieved a little bit about how it's a massive, massive, massive. I mean, the scale I go through the scale and I actually work out some numbers that chat GPT has learned, has processed what uh, would take uh, a human about 30,000 years to process. Uh, which cognitively, I, I do this for a specific reason. It means that obviously this is not how we learn language because otherwise a child would have to be 30,000 years old before they speak. So obviously mm -hmm. that's not how we learn language. And then I go through technically what happened. There were several improvements. The biggest is now a classic paper, attention is all you need. And basically, uh, instead of coding the word, uh, the meaning of a word in a vector, we are now coding all the combinations of how a word appears in many, many contexts. So we're, we're paying attention to the context, if you want, which was a brilliant technique. And I show how it really works. It's it's a predictive model, predict the next word. And if you do that recursively, it can start spitting out and generating text uh, indefinitely. 
and then I go how to use it in practical applications, and I'm doing that now actually in, in a couple of applications. We to be useful in the enterprise, unless you just want to have fun and test it at uh, home. To be useful in the enterprise, you can't just issue a, a prompt against an LLM like GPT. You first consult your domain specific knowledge and you then create a new prompt, a new question with uh, your domain factual information as a context, and then you say, answer me. Basically, we're using the LLM as a fluent linguistic parrot or fluent linguistic machine, but because it doesn't know anything about anything factual from non-factual, we ask a question telling it, consider these facts in mind as a context then it can be useful in the enterprise. And these are techniques called fine tuning, but RAG is the most powerful now. Okay, then, so I basically said the good, the bad about LLMs, uh, the, the good, what happened. And then I go through all the real issues that have nothing to do with scale or the actual model. Is it the one that Facebook has, or it's about limitations in theory. I call them in theory limitations. Recent paper just proved that these models will always have uh, a problem with object identity because the only operation they have is similarity. There's no notion of object identity and thus uh, they can't do factual reasoning. Then I go through an, uh, a limitation that was uh, published by Stanford Research, which uh, talks about model collapse. Because language is infinite, I can't keep training this stuff on the existing corpus. Uh, so now we have a problem. Large language models are being trained on their own output. So they're eating their own lives in a way. Uh, technically, this means that they start believing their own lies in a way. I mean, that's the intuitive explanation. But essentially, Technically speaking, they start to zoom on a specific place in the network and it reinforces their own decisions before and it will lead to what is called a model collapse. In other words, they start repeating themselves because they start believing their own output in a sense. This is a very important result that just came out. And there is no other way because language is infinite. They can't keep, uh, I mean, how much language can you consume? Infinity is such a big number. There are other problems that are also a function of the paradigm. Truthfulness. For these models, all text was created equal. They don't know, uh, they don't know what piece of text, what fragment of text is true and what's not true. So there's no notion of ground truth. Because they are also uh, under the mercy of data, they will always have bias and toxicity and offensive language because that's that's going to be in the data. Explainability, we talked about it a few times. These are hopelessly unexplainable models. Hallucination, although I don't like this term, I, I, I wrote about this somewhere else, that hallucination is something you subscribe, you ascribe to smart entities. <laughs> so it's an honor to tell, to say they hallucinate. They don't hallucinate. I mean, Van Gogh hallucinates. Uh, Bertrand Russell hallucinates. Smart people hallucinate. What they do is errors uh, because statistics can, can, uh, uh, can go uh, wrong. So anyway, we call it hallucination, but that's an honor they don't, uh, they don't, uh, they don't, they can't achieve. Anyway, the point is all of the above is not a function of the model or the, or the scale or scale. These are byproducts of the sub-symbolic neural network paradigm itself. These are limitations, in theory limitations. And then I go through, OK, how about their language competency? And I say that we're playing games here. We're testing them on these things at the uh, bottom right corner, search, summarization, sentiment analysis, topic modeling, blah, blah, blah. And we have benchmarks. And you have all kinds of evaluation papers. And uh, everybody speaks of beating the state of the art 0.01. It's a game. That's not how you evaluate these models. Why? Generally speaking, we have formal and informal languages. Formal languages are programming languages or specification languages like HTML, XML. 
And we have informal languages like English or French or Danish, and you can map from one to the other. Uh, so I go through these and I say the real challenge, I, I say the way we are evaluating them now here is uh, meaningless. These are all, and the reason is these are all subjective tasks like my search or your search results, my summary or your summary. We're playing a game. There is no objective criteria in all of these. Mm. You you got that, Tyler? Like uh, mm -hmm. basically, basically you're saying this is a good summary. Like who says this is not a, this is not an objective evaluation uh, to separate the boys from the men, so to speak. Like there is a way to evaluate these objectively. Go from informal to formal or vice versa. What do I mean? I mean, I have text, right? If you really understand language, I should be able to ask you to read this text and generate for me the data and entities and relations that are implicit in that text. Here you have zero degrees of freedom. You can't go wrong, I, right? Full understanding means you really understood this text and you can formally represent it in a knowledge graph or in a relational database or whatever. Did you, do you do you understand this point? Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Or or the inverse. I give you an English question, a, que a query in English. Translate that into an unambiguous SQL query and go get me the answer. Again, zero degrees of freedom. You can't make a mistake because if you if you uh, generate the wrong SQL query, you're going to generate the wrong answer. You have no hope of getting it right. So I say. You want to you wanna really evaluate these? Stop playing games. Let's do informal to formal, natural language to knowledge graph and vice versa. Right? And I say I did test them on that and they suck. I didn't say that, but <laughs> I say the linguistic competency shows then. And I give a couple of examples, like uh, if you ask it, what does timely modify in the first one john made a timely acquisition they get it right but only by accident because timely precedes acquisition timely acquisition okay we're talking about a an acquisition that was timely right now to the real test is john made a brilliant acquisition and they say yeah brilliant is modifying acquisition the wrong acquisitions are events they are activities they are abstract objects that are that brilliant doesn't apply to what we mean by John made a brilliant acquisition is that it was brilliant of John to make the acquisition, right? The brilliant here is John, not the acquisition. Mm -hmm. The point of this example, uh, Tyler, is if I read this and I want you to convert this to a knowledge graph, I want the property brilliant to be attached to John, not acquisition. Otherwise, otherwise you didn't get the point. Or if I say Mary appreciated the thoughtful gift from John, an inanimate object like uh, like uh, an iPad cannot be thoughtful. OK, it was thoughtful of John. You got mm -hmm. me? Yeah. yeah. So when you when you really test them, like uh, I'm nasty on these things because I know how they work, then you understand, then you figure out easily that they don't understand. You. Nothing. And it okay. seems like such a rudimentary grammatical lesson because what you're really talking about here is the difference between subject and object and being a, be able to identify what the object is in the sentence. Uh, yeah, no, they, they do that well. You see here, there's a subtle semantic uh, thing going on. If you look at the first two sentences, Tyler, structure-wise, syntax-wise, there's a the same. John made a adjective noun, right? Mm -hmm. Say, one in one case, the adjective goes all the way and goes against the syntactic surface order structure, and goes all the way to modify uh, uh, something mentioned at the beginning. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but these guys, because they go sequentially, that's the syntactic structure. That's usually adjective noun. The adjective is modifying noun. They don't do this deep semantic analysis and say, no, 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 no. The order here is not. It's not the surface order modification. Right. right. So, in yeah. in the second sentence, brilliant has to say, no, 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 no. no. I know I'm saying brilliant some noun. But the brilliant here is what was mentioned way before. It gets back to what you're talking about, about the uh, gestalt, because you're yes. in the second yes. sentence, you're trying to understand the whole 
of the sentence rather than its constituent parts. Right, right. They don't have this compositional structure again because they don't have structures and, and discrete attributes and syntactic structures and compositional. Uh, they they take the whole thing as a blob and they say, OK, looks like I have an adjective noun. So they or thoughtful gift. Gifts cannot be thoughtful. It was thoughtful of John, right? So basically, if you do this real test, you can easily see that. I give another example here, which is the like, OK, now I'm saying here's a piece of text. OK, the newspaper on the table in front of me used to be my favorite. However, since it fired my favorite columnist, I don't read it anymore. That's the usual English, usual language we use every day. And I say, what does it refer to here? And I say, since it fired my favorite columnist. The point of this example is the newspaper on the table in front of me is not the, the physical object in front of me, is not the one that fired my favorite columnist, right? So here I'm referring to newspaper. We call this in language metonymy. I'm using newspaper to refer to different senses of newspaper at the same time. And, and we, we know how to do this thing, but we know that the newspaper in front of me can be the physical object that I'm actually reading, right? That's the one that's on the table. But it could be the company, it could be the board of directors. I mean, if I say the New York Times endorsed Joe Biden, it's not the paper in front of me that endorsed Joe Biden, it's the editors of the New York Times. We call this metonymy. They have no clue, okay? They're all listed in the paper that was published, actually. But but it's it's really interesting, though, because there seems to be this, um, I think maybe the, one of the reasons why people react to it so well is because of a, a an intuition that men, many people have that LLMs and their current uh, approach don't really map on to our, even our just basically intuitive understanding of what language is and how it works. Right. Right. Although, although it's taking time for this realization, but, uh, you know, we have to be sober because we were drunk, really, the first few weeks, the first even few months. People are starting to get sober as they try to apply these things to real things and discover that this thing, OK, it memorized all of language. It can speak fluently, but it doesn't know anything like it's not human like at all. The, the, the realization is. Uh, and so I'm starting to get people to listen to me, which is. Uh, <laughs> because there is something good that they did, like I said. I mean, they did a brilliant thing saying, we don't know much about language. I can't start with a theory that I made up, like Chomsky or whatever, playing God. We have no clue about language. Language is a mysterious thing in the mind. We know a lot about the brain, but not that abstract mind, conceptualization, mm -hmm. thoughts, how we make thoughts and how we encode them externally in English or in Chinese. So this bottom up approach was brilliant. And I talked about it way back before they did all this, this stuff that we have to uncover it. We can't play God. So they did this brilliant thing, but let's do it symbolically. Otherwise, this statistical mesh will never understand language. So I think I have the right ingredients, but I mean, it takes time to make converse yeah. to support you. I Now I have few I, people saying I, I agree with you. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good segue into some of my questions I'd like to ask about uh, that are just more big picture and even a little abstract. So I've noticed in your work you use the word understanding quite a lot, but the way you use it is is more precise than I think the colloquial understanding of the right. word understanding. Right. Um, so can you can you talk? Yeah, Again, and actually, and actually, people ask about uh, about it for me. They say, but it it depends on what you mean by understanding. And and for you, Walid, what is understanding? And I and I have to make that actually excellent question because there's understanding that's specific to language, and there's understanding the bigger understanding, right? I mean, there are many other things other than language that we do understand also. They're not linguistic, actually. I mean, I can understand an action. I can understand uh, a reaction. I can understand a phenomenon. Understanding, you see what I mean? Like, I can understand some process. I can understand some 
some event. I can uh, so it's I use understanding. My use of understanding is specific to language. I'm being very humble. I'm not claiming I have a notion of understanding in general, like I understand life. I mean, no, no. I my 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 use of the word understanding. When I when I explain it this way, people say then yes, the way you're describing understanding makes sense. So it's specific to language. Now, what is understanding when it comes to language? Here here what it here's what it is. How well, how and why do we use language? I have a thought in some language of thought. It's not in English initially. It's a thought, right? We don't know how thoughts look inside, but let's say we have a, a universal innate language of thought, mentalese, right? And it's nothing like Chinese. That language of thought, I create thoughts in it. Some some Cognitive science believe that it it's really isomorphic to language. It's almost like just a map. Like it's it's compositional. It's productive. We can make an infinite number of thoughts. That's why I can make an infinite number of sentences because the number of thoughts I can entertain is infinite. It's productive. This is Chomsky, Jerry Forder, and I agree with them. Steven Pinker, they're, they're real heavyweights in cognitive science. I believe them. The number of thoughts I can entertain productively by 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 combinatorics is infinite right it, it's we we know that and thus our languages that express the thoughts must be isomorphic because i can have a thought i can have an Im infinite number of thoughts i have to have an infinite number of sentences i can make and that's why when children reach language competency they can understand anything that they never heard before we have this machinery that's Chomsky stuff that I agree with. At least that's the part of Chomsky that was brilliant, right? By when I say Chomsky, Chomsky and company, it's a it's big it's a big circle. Okay, so understanding when it comes to language, I have a thought that I want to convey to you. I encode it in the language we agreed on for now, English, right? I encode it in English, in English characters and sequence and following the grammar of English, blah, blah, blah. And I send it to you, hoping that when you decode it into a thought, the thought you constructed is as close as possible to the thought that I was initially trying to convey. If you, the thought you made inside is very close to the thought I am trying to convey, we say you understood me. The, and and there's, a, there's a whole literature on this, actually in the blog, because that I still want to write as a book. I, I have two blogs about this phenomenon only because evolutionary biologists have proved that this communication mechanism that evolved over hundred thousands of years we made it so clever, so optimal that I say the minimum required not to overlook so that the communication is effective. When I'm conveying the thought, I say the minimum that I need to say, but not less than the minimum because I want you to understand me after all, right? But I don't say more. I don't say needless stuff. It's amazing how we found an optimal point to say the minimum required, but not less and not more. That's why we leave many things that we don't literally explicitly put in the text, because I can assume what I'm leaving out is stuff that you know. We call that background knowledge, right? So here's an example if I say- Reading between the lines. Reading between the lines in folk uh, language, we say, oh, come on, you can read between the lines. You can fill out the rest. You can make up the rest. A typical example, I say, Mary enjoyed the movie. And you know, I mean, Mary enjoyed watching the movie. Although, in theory, people can direct movies, can produce movies, can do many things other than watch movies, right? Why did you implicitly know, I mean, she enjoyed the movie? Because the most salient relationship between people and movies is watching. People watch movies. 
very few directed movies. And I mean, we can go to the mechanics. Why did why why the hidden? If I want to know, if I want to explicitly say she enjoyed directing, I have to say it. But if I leave it out, it's watching. It's the same with reading. Mary enjoyed the book. Mm -hmm. I can burn a book, I can buy a book, I can sell a book, I can write a book, but very few people write. So the implicit here, Mary enjoyed the book I gave her. Mary enjoyed reading the book. I mean, and, and people say language is ambiguous. No, stop it. Language is not ambiguous. A four year old will know if I say Mary enjoyed the book I gave her, that she enjoyed reading the damn book. Language is not ambiguous. So this, we do this for communication effectiveness. But the idea is you understood me if. So to me, understanding, again, with respect to language is I'm trying to convey a thought. That's why the real test for these large language models is here's a small paragraph. Can you construct the thought formally behind this? Then you understood me. Stop mm -hmm. playing games. Summarization. What do you mean? This is you're not proving anything to me because my summary is better than yours. Let's go to court, right? So the real, real test is understanding. I have, I am conveying some thoughts in this paragraph. Can you deconstruct them? Can you formally tell me you understood it? That's understanding. Right. Like, and, yeah. and so I take your point that language is not ambiguous, but it seems like when we talk about understanding, then it's, it still seems like we're talking about something wholly subjective. And I don't mean subjective by ambiguous. I mean subjective in the sense that there is an agent involved, which gets us into the mire of philosophy of mind. And so, I mean, some some AI researchers think AI conscious is not possible. Others think it is. Others think it's beside the point or incidental. Some say it's an illusion, but it still is there. Um, hard to define, yeah, controversial. Yeah. So I guess my question is like, is is that is is consciousness or mind like a dragon waiting at the end of the road of AI that we have to slay? Or is it something that's that we can pretend is irrelevant or incidental? No, no, we, we, it doesn't help to pretend. If it's an issue, it's an issue. I mean, we have to face it. But there are two things in what you said. There's the subjectivity part the individual subjective interpretation of things. That's something I'll answer. Consciousness is another beast altogether that is way and above understanding. Consciousness is about, do you know what you know? The, uh, consciousness is about this reflective state, this meta state. It's thinking about thinking. It's mm -hmm. knowing that you are thinking. Like I'm conscious of, I mean, Making thoughts and understanding thoughts is one thing, but knowing, basically it's thinking about thinking. It's a reflective thing. Consciousness is is another level of thinking. It's thinking about- Metacognition. Thinking. It's metacognition. It's, it's knowing my cognitive state and reflecting on it. It's thinking about my thinking. It's knowing about what I know. It's, it's a metacognitive state, consciousness which is another beast I, I don't want to get into because I, to be honest with you, I'm suspicious of having this level of reflective. And by the way, the reflective tower doesn't end. Mm -hmm. Doesn't end, it's infinite. Like I can think about the thinking of my thinking. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, you get into a philosophy that's like hairy. It's like, wow, hold on there. I don't know. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Like, because once you go to two levels, recursively, it's infinite. I mean, I can, I can say, I believe what I know. I, I, I think that what I believe about what I know is correct. I mean, I have three layers here. I, there is some fact. That's the first layer, understanding. I understood this fact. Well, I'll get into the subjective part. And then I can say, I believe this fact. And I can say, I think I believe this fact. So I have, we call them prepositional attitudes. Like I have attitudes about my belief. And I can have, 
I can know something, but the, but they are um, they are not the same. Like I believe, I know, I think they're not the same at all because I can believe something that's true. I can know something that's not true, and I think I know it, right? So their their truth, belief, and knowledge are not the same. And when you get to consciousness, we get to these states of I know what I know, because in most cases, you, believe it or not, we know things that we don't know that we know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we can actually believe things that uh, we don't know, and we can believe things. So these three, known unknowns and unknown knowns and yeah, unknown, and, unknowns. and belief about what I know, and I can know my belief. Like these are reflective attitudes that have to do with the I, I as in. Not the I, but the letter I, the I, the me. So consciousness is a huge beast. There are many, there are many theories, but just theories. Mm-hmm. But well, we like, know, we know, we know what it is intuitively. It's a, a reflective state, a higher level state of metacognition or meta knowledge, or 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 it's a state of basically it's knowing what you know and what you don't know and reflecting on what you know like saying yeah it's it's a it's a well not to go too far down this spiral because i do i do want to get back to but okay the the understanding and subjective because there is a misconception here and when i explain it to people i'm not saying they all agree with me but at least the confusion is gone they say but wait a minute you're saying understanding is an objective function you i have something and we all understand the understanding is objective and it's it's actually much simpler and mechanistic than we think how you interpret something and what you add to it from your own biases your own experiences that's subjective so for what i what do i mean here we read the same article or the same book you get from it something different from mine that doesn't mean you understood it different we both understood what was said the same way your own interpretation of what you understood will be different. So, for example, in a conversation, someone is speaking, we both understood what they said. But our reaction is different because my synthesis of what I understood, which is the same as what you understood, we we both deconstructed the English into an internal thought and said, okay, I understood what was said from here on, your synthesis and interpretation of what you heard will be different from others because here you bring in your previous experience, your stereotypes, your biases, your own individual knowledge and and and, and memories. And but the understanding is objective. It's more mechanical than we think. Someone is conveying this thought. I understood what they said. What I get out of it and how I combine it with all the other stuff I have in my uh, knowledge base is individual and different. But otherwise, we can't communicate. The understanding bit is very mechanical. Can I deconstruct the thought from the English expression? Can I understand what was said? What I do with it and how I interpret it is my business, right? So we have to separate understanding from probably the best word is comprehension how i comprehend it and interpret it is individual but the mechanics of decoding english into the thought being conveyed like that's why we that's why when i write a book i'm not worried about sending the message across people mm-hmm. will understand it what they take from it is individual yes Otherwise, I have. I, otherwise, I would have to write a book for every person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, people mis- misunderstand the the difference. Yeah, Un- understanding is very mechanical, very simple, very simple. But it's really deconstruct decoding some linguistic utterance in some language and trying to guess using our background knowledge uh, what the thought the author or the speaker is that is trying to be conveyed. We understand it the same, but I take from it 
after I synthesize it and analyze it and interpret it in the context of my brain and my experiences, I synthesize from it something different from you. But doesn't this go get back to this um, dualistic hang up that I have where you have a correspondence between a word and its referent between a, a subject and its object mm. and and which is essential to our idea of understanding to language. But then when we talk about large language models, we we can't posit the existence of that subject or that mm. agent, and therefore we can't posit the possibility even of understanding in the AI system. Right, and that's why I don't think these are actually, and it's an oxymoron that we call them large language models. They are not language models. They are not models of language. They are statistical models of regularities we found in language. Uh, mm. So, so the the term large language model is very misleading. These are not models of language. And I show with the numbers, uh, a child would have to be 35,000 years old before they speak. That's that's obviously not how language works. So these are not models of language at all. Uh, and that's why they have these shortcomings. And that's why the long tail will always be there. They will never go all the way. But they were good in picking up the low hanging fruits, if you want. Like, uh, there are so many things with massive data analysis that I can figure out. The, op the low hanging fruits are picked up by these, I have to admit. But uh, they will not go all the way, and all the way is infinite. Mm -hmm. It's way beyond them, right? Uh, that That's what separates the boys from the men. This is it for these large language models. And actually, Sam Altman admitted as much. He said, any new improvements not going to come out of scale. We need uh, we need something new. That's an admission that their engineers tried to scale it further and they reached a plateau. In other mm -hmm. words, there's a limit to how much you can do statistically. Right? But uh, as we and Chomskyans and Fodor and people in semantics and philosophy of language know, language is infinite. The number of thoughts I can make and the number of new sentences I can make is infinite. So even one trillion over infinity is zero. So what they did is they discovered, like I said, the low hanging fruits, the, the stuff that will impress someone sitting home and trying to check GPT or say, what the hell is that? Blah, blah, blah. But as you can see, I gave you a few examples that require deep understanding. Nah, that they will never get because that is a byproduct of a symbolic conceptual structure that's not just statistical correlations and they cannot get there it's not a function of scale and they're they didn't admit that in so many words but they said it's it's reported that apparently they tried to scale it further and it's plateauing if mm -hmm. not dip, if not dipping down and they're not admitting because probably with more data more and more like uh I there is a case to make that the performance might start to dip down. So mm -hmm. they reach a point that that's the best we can do. Yeah. Because in Google Translate, I know from inside information. At some point, they stopped training it on new data and Google is not short on data. Every day they have terabytes of new data. They stopped uh, training their translators because with more and more tera, tera, more terabytes of data, the performance start to dip down. So they said, oh, that's the best we can do. Mm. Basically, there's a limit to how much I can get from data in a just right. blind, blind approach without any conceptual system, without any knowledge representation. Uh, you can get a lot. You can get the low hanging fruits and those probably in the middle if you jump it. But the really good stuff, you can't get that this way. Um, you, I saw a comment on uh, your ODSC paper, which is called Towards Explainable and Language Agnostic LLMs. The comment said, and it was kind of, it was kind of snarky, I wonder if we will ever finally get explainable in language agnostic humans. And so apart from being like a subtle, like sort of snarky comment, I think yeah. it raised, raised an interesting point, which is this. Um, 
what's the difference between explainability in LLMs and explainability in human behavior? And why is that distinction important? Yeah, again, uh, all the terms, my, maybe I should always make that clear. It's, it's like when I use the term understanding, I mean it in the technical sense of uh, understanding the mental thought behind an utterance. That's it. I'm not talking about understanding Jim. And so when I say explainability, again, I'm very focused on. Uh, but explainability, uh, but humans do explain themselves. They might lie in their explanation they might not be coherent in how they're but they are explaining the the it's like fred sommer says it makes sense to say uh big cat whether uh, the cat is big or not is not the point it's not about the truth or falsity of my statement but it's sensible to say big of cat. Uh, and here, same thing. People explain themselves regardless of whether their explanation is coherent or rational or believable. Or, but at least I can explain. I can do a reverse. I can, I can do a reverse engineering of my decision and explain. I might be lying, I might not be coherent, I might not know how to explain myself. That's besides the point. As opposed to these large language models that are based on sub-symbolic systems cannot even attempt to explain themselves. They're unexplainable, which is different. We are explainable, whether we do it right or not. So when, when people say, are people explainable? I mean, you're talking philosophically, like do we... But we can, if I rationally think about it. So those cannot. When I say unexplainable, I mean, even if they want to, they cannot. We can't. So you see the difference? It's like people say, mm -hmm. understand. You might interpret things differently, but you understood the thought. Mm -hmm. We Everything we associate with uh, the, uh, look, Cognition is very complex and human behavior is very complex. And so it's hard for people to take. It's like when we say language is ambiguous and I say language is not ambiguous. I'm talking technically. I'm saying language is purposely vague because for efficient communication. But we in reality, it's not ambiguous. We always work out what was said. And we did it uh, like this on purpose. So in the end, it's not ambiguous. I see a little girl in a zoo. I don't know her. She just came from Peru. And I converse with her for hours. We don't stop each other saying, what do you mean? What do you mean? We converse. Language is not ambiguous. Technically, it sounds like it's ambiguous. But we do this for effective communication. We leave a lot of stuff out. Unless we say something genuinely ambiguous for some reason, I assume too much. And then we occasionally say, wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Like sometimes we do assume too much, a bit too much. And in these rare occasions, we stop each other and say, wait a minute, what do you mean? Oh, OK, I thought you knew that. So I, I probably assumed you know something, right? So the same thing here, like uh, we say, we are as humans unexplained. We we like to associate. We have to separate the technical device explainability from the fact that humans are sometimes irrational and they don't do the right explanation. That these are two different notions. It's like, uh, but technically we can explain ourselves. I might sound. My explanation might sound garbage or bullshit or a lie or or irrational, but at least I can if I want to. It's within uh, it's within our capability to be explainable to explain ourselves. Mm -hmm. As opposed, so I'm talking technically. Mm -hmm. I can be ambiguous all the time and frustrate the hell out of people, and they don't like to talk to me anymore because every time they have to say, well, "What the hell do you mean?" Right, but. But that's different from the fact that we can communicate unambiguously right. and, and, and 
and ordinary spoken language is not ambiguous. Otherwise, we can't talk, we can't communicate. If language yeah. is ambiguous, nobody should buy a book because you, <laughs> you will not understand anything. And language right. is not ambiguous. It's obvious what someone is trying to say. And I <laughs> always find it, I always find it mysterious that, man, there's an existential proof. I mean, you, you read the newspaper, you read blogs, you read books. If language is ambiguous, you will not touch any book because you would say, uh, wait a minute, if every sentence is ambiguous and this the thing is made 200,000 sentences, right? That's 200,000 ambiguous sentences. I'm not gonna suffer trying to understand them because they're not, you understand them effortlessly. You go like, oh, okay, oh, okay, I know it. So, and then uh, five minutes later they say, but language is ambiguous, excuse me? How the hell is it ambiguous? How many times do you stop someone and say, wait a minute, what do you mean? Can you disambiguate the sentence for me? We don't do that. Mm -hmm. And people ignore this fact. So again, we, we mix rationality with, because we're so complex and we, so we say people are irrational, people are unexplainable, language is ambiguous, everything is relative. I hate this uh, relativistic philosophy. No, things are more systematic than we think. That's why we, that's why we communicate well. That's why we understand each other. That's why I think that's why the bridge is holding up. That's why uh, there's a piece of metal that can fly with us 15, 12,000 feet above the sky for 13 hours. Things work because there's a system underneath everything. My favorite quote is Immanuel Kant. Everything in nature in the inanimate or animate world works according to some rule, although we might not be aware of it. So mm -hmm. because we because we don't, and that's where gods and religions came out. I don't know what's your belief system, but we subscribe every time we don't know anything, God knows. And then, so the more we know, the less he knows, right? So, so every time we have some complex behavior, because we don't still understand human behavior and how we think. And so we ascribe these pro problems, you know, people are unexplainable, people are irrational, people are. If we were irrational and unexplainable and everything is ambiguous and everything is relative, we would not have survived millions of years, man. Right. We yeah. would have, we would have, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, there's a system, right? Mm -hmm. With exceptions. But there's there's order out of the chaos, like the, what seems like chaos. There's an order. There's a rule underneath everything. I agree with Immanuel Kant in this one. The history of humanity on this on this planet tells us, man, things work like a clock. Unbelievable. You hinted at this in your talk, but when it comes to bottom-up reverse engineering of language at scale. What are some of the, what are those foundational axioms that you, to build off of? What does that look like? Okay, here's what, the first thing, very good question. <laughs> the first thing is I want to discover what I call the dimensions of meaning, like, because the building block of conceptual thought is concepts. We conceptualize. I mean, the, the, this, uh, the, this much we know. Concepts are the building blocks of thoughts. We make thoughts by combining concepts. We conceptualize about things. But what are, to me, the first discovery that should be the first axioms that we should uncover? Like, what the hell are these? Uh, what are the building blocks of meaning? What makes a concept? Like, we would, um, I can theorize forever. We know we have concepts, but what are they? Like, right, right? And what is the nature of a concept? And obviously they have to be, these dimensions have to be language agnostic. Why? Because we think the same, whether we're Indian or Danish or like in all languages. And apparently there are things like that and we can uncover them from language. I'll give you an example, but to tell you what they are. In every language we have objects. Forget the language, whether you're in India or in Nigeria or in Sweden, we have things, right? There are things out there, and these things are not all physical. There are abstract things like uh, um, there's a 
there are uh, things we call dancing. We saw people going like this and we labeled that concept and we said that is a dancing. Let's agree that the, the right word for that crazy activity is dancing, right? Walking. Okay. We, we say, what are these people doing? We called it walking so that we know what we're talking about when we say someone is walking. It all oh, he's doing that thing, right? So it could be an abstract thing. And then again, physical of course, we labeled that thing like a tree. OK, we said every time you see this thing, that's a rock. Right? OK. So we know we have objects and that's culturally uh, agnostic. Language agnostic. We might call it something else in China, but there's a tree, right? And, and there's a walking. Right? So those are language agnostic primitive things that exist. The second level is discovering. How we talk about these things like. Uh, OK. Every object has properties. I can describe an object. In any language, I have an object that I can describe it some. So I can say things. OK, we agreed there are trees, obviously. Right? But there are things that I can sensibly ascribe to trees. Smart is not one of them. For example, just to be like, how do we discover what, how we talk about things? But I can say that's a tall tree. And we'll see how the tall came about. Then I, the point is I can describe objects. We have objects, we agreed on that, and they can be physical or abstract. We can describe objects. We can, I have objects and I can say things about the object, right? Which means an entity, one dimension of entities is that they have properties. We just discovered one dimension of meaning that I can ascribe properties to objects. Language agnostic, culture agnostic, time and place independent. Any object can be described by some properties. That's a that's a primitive cognitive relation. Uh, how do we discover that? We can see I. I'll give you an actual example. That's a slide that I didn't show. Other things is objects can be the agent of we have activities. We have events happenings. We see them. We see things happen, right? And in every happening, there might be participants and agents and objects of this activity. So uh, entities can be the agent of some activity. They can be the ones that created or started the activity or. And they can be the object of some activity. They can be they can do stuff and stuff can be done onto them. And this is again culture independent. This is not Norwegian. This is not German. Mm -hmm. This is a cognitive conceptual concept. The, the concept of agenthood or being the object of some being on the receiving end of some mm -hmm. thing that was done to me. So books can be read. This is something I can do with a book. But believe it or not, a book can do something. A book can inspire. The book is the agent of an inspiration. A book can be the agent of an argument. A book can be the agent of a whole new revolution. A book can be so books, that passive thing that's in front of me, that artifact, can be the agent of change, the agent of uh, uh, controversy. Can can start something. A book, yeah. like a human being, can be the agent of some activity. That makes me think of uh, how in some Native American languages, I think Algonquin, rather than gendered nouns like Spanish or Italian, they have nouns, they have uh, permutations based on perceived sentience of the object. So for example, like a tree would have a, uh, the same gendered uh, permutation as, as like, uh, a a female, frog or, uh, uh, or a human being, something. Yeah. Actually, actually, the native Indians even ascribe lifelike qualities to objects. So you can, 
but physical object, we don't have to go that far to make the metaphor of a human. Although we've done uh, like machines and humans, and machines are a, are a complete metaphorical mapping. So we say the machine is running. Excuse me, I don't see legs on my laptop. To run, you have to have legs. Or we say it's dead. Never, like it's not alive to be dead. So we ascribe human, we date. This metaphorical mapping we do. Uh, in some cultures, it's even more because they ascribe lifelike properties to, yes. But even if we don't, I mean, linguistically, conceptually, a book can be the agent of something, the agent of change. I mean, uh, I can say Das Kapital uh, inspired uh, or, uh, right? I mean, there are books that have actually created revolutions. The Bolshevik Revolution started with mm -hmm. the Communist Manifesto. Uh, the, a book can do, a book can do stuff like a human can, right? But mm -hmm. The point but that is, is it gets in a fuzzy concept of of like when you're where you're ascribing agency, are you ascribing it to Das Kapital or are you also ascribing it to Karl Marx? It's it's sort of a little fuzzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do double counting, which means the the book, but but way after Karl Marx died, the book is still the agent of something. So the actually it's not the physical book. Here we go to metonymy, but I, that's getting us to. It's the content. It's the information content sense of a book. Remember, we can say the newspaper in so many senses. The newspaper fired the columnist. Well, it's not the physical object. Same with book. Like it's the content of Das Kapital that was the agent of some happening, right? But uh, in all cases, I mean, we can we can agree and disagree on the nature of these things, but they do exist. We have the notion of objects that can be described by properties and they can be the agent of something, they can be the object of something, they can be in a certain state, that's also universal, that's not Chinese. So I can be ill, an object can be described by a certain state, and in this case, a physical, a physical state. I can be happy, in this case, it's a psychological state, but I can be in a certain state and that's Chinese and Nigerian and Ethiopian and Danish and German, right? Mm -hmm. Objects can be in a certain state. Objects can be going through a certain process. So the book is in print. The book is in review. The book is burning. The book is burning. It's going through a process of annihilation. So objects can be in a state or they can be still not in the final state, but going through a process. Uh, objects can be part of other objects. That's a very primitive cognitive relation. That is not culture dependent. So uh, trees have parts, but also abstract events, uh, uh, abstract objects have parts. Uh, uh, they can be part of, or you can be contained in the inverse. So these are primitive relations that are the building blocks that we use to glue together thoughts. Mm -hmm. I can show you an example. And they are language agnostic. Any, I mean, the notion of property is like, what? It's not Chinese. Every object can be described by something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, physical objects have color and weight and mass and height and uh, abstract objects, events, for example, have a starting point, have a duration, have a, right? So these are not Chinese or, or, uh, or Egyptian. Or th these are the building blocks of our cognitive co conceptual system, right? Okay. 